Hi, everybody. I'm Marianne Waterhouse. I have cared about sustainable practices and well, or, you know, cared about the environment since I was a kid, but I didn't really do that much about it. I mean, I recycled a little bit, but I, I didn't do that much. And it was literally something as maybe cliche sounding, but it was Greta Thunberg that got me off my butt. I When I saw that girl doing what she was doing, I thought, oh, wow, I need to really get in action and do a lot more. So I did a lot of research and that scared me. And it got me feeling there was a perfect opportunity to make a difference and to hopefully inspire a lot of people, take it seriously and then try to make change on our sets. Do what you can. My, I really believe just start somewhere do one thing make one difference and you'll inspire other people to do more so the first thing was plastic water bottles we they're everywhere they, they're hopefully they're not as much everywhere anymore and they are pretty much like the poster child for environmental waste right they're everything bad and we use them all the time so that was the first thing that we started to change it's actually sounds easier than it is it's easy i think and it was pretty easy for us in places like offices and shops because you can put it in your water coolers. We made a crew gift if everyone got a water bottle at the beginning of the show. We were able to do it in the offices. We were able to do it in stages. What we did was we took the water coolers, the ones that we are now using that are, that are COVID safe and friendly, the touchless water coolers, strapped them onto a dolly so that they were mobile and you could move them around. Then this was a cost. We hired a sustainable PA, super low cost person that just cared about the environment that wanted to move this dolly around. This person was responsible for making sure that there was one of these on location, even when we moved a midday move and we're on the side of a road, putting one by craft, putting one by camera, putting one by the stash. So then we designed sandwich boards with big signs saying water station this way and put them, you know, where we needed to. It took three shows in to get to the point where there wasn't like plastic water bottles sometimes. We switched over to cardboard waters. The creation of them requ doesn't require petroleum or the recycling takes one third the energy that it takes to recycle plastics. So if you do have to have something disposable, the cardboard is is a great solution. It's the first step. And from there, we went on to other single-use plastic. In that case, is especially what's happened in COVID, is that we're all getting our meals or catering and our craft in these single-use serving things. First thing we did was actually use, use an amazing invention, which is a reusable device to put food on called a plate. That was the best thing we did when we were in studio because you, reusable is the best. So the first thing you know about compostable is it's not more expensive. Everyone thinks it is, but it's not. It's actually cheaper than these plastic containers that they're using. The second thing that comes up is that people complain that they leak um, with certain meals and meals that are, are wet. Our workaround with doing that was, and this will sound so silly, but just two. You just use two containers. You have your food and then you have another compostable under it. And that worked really well. Every once in a while, we'd change a cater the caterer or something and someone would show up with black plastic. And I don't know if you know how bad black plastic is forget plastic water bottles like black plastic makes them look like you know I don't know like a good thing because black plastic's not even recyclable so it's going straight to the landfill so every time that your crew you know your 200 people all get their meal served them in one of those black plastics day after day that's filling up the landfill immediately and and it's become such a thing in COVID right that we are using those black plastics we did a couple things like in the covid world we got permission and i don't know you know and hopefully we're moving to a more of an endemic not pandemic situation so it'll be different but we were able to go back to a buffet style serving even that if this was in 2020 putting the buffet behind a secure is secure barriers so that we didn't need everything to be prepackaged, which was the caterers arguments for using the black plastic and we also then used the compostable containers we got through it and we you know every now and then we would be we'd have styrofoam or something show up but believe me also styrofoam is not nearly as bad as black plastic but it's it's not a solution the compostable is the best and it is literally cheaper than the plastic so if your production managers are concerned about the cost the caterers will actually charge you less for a compostable container what that leads you to is if you've got compostable containers are you really composting? And that became a thing that we had to face. On the first show, you know, I, I was way more naive about this stuff. And I just thought like, well, it'll all end up in the right place. 
and the crew were the ones who were more, you know, there, you know, I remember so many crew were like, no, nah, I'm not going to bother putting things in that bin because it's never going to, it's never going to end up. They, it all goes to the same place. There's, it's all just a myth. And they're not completely wrong because if you don't sort things properly, that does happen, right? Or if you don't have the right vendor, the right garbage vendor, that can happen. And that really was happening for me that three shows ago. So there's a bunch of stuff that came out of that. And this, and this was like, like where I first started to be aware of it was halfway through this first show that I made this big commitment on. The first thing we did was realize that people weren't putting stuff in the right, in the right bins. So making sure that we had really clearly defined like garbage, blue bin, green bin, and then making sure that we had signage that really explained exactly what went in each one. Because even if people wanted to do it, it's confusing. It's it's different between municipalities. It's probably different between shows, but depending on your garbage vendor. So that was a really important thing. And then what we realized was even with the science, you're in the studio, it's dark, people can't read what it says, people are too in too much of a hurry to read what it says. So you need to actually teach them. So we started sticking somebody at times like lunch by the bins and having them actually say, oh, this goes here, you know, let me help you. This thing goes here, dump that there, put that there. We did have a sustainability PA. Uh, she would stand there, help people understand where to put things. Like if you put your garbage in the right, in your recycling right place, you got candy as a treat after lunch. So little things like that make people actually inspired to do it. So that's, you know, my takeaway from that is it was having the right disposal set up, enough of them around that people could find them but the signage to like explain it and then even people to explain it because you don't have to tell them every day. Once a person, if a person's invested and cares about it, once they know what goes where, then they can do it themselves. It's like, you know, the whole thing about, you know, giving a person a fish or teaching them to fish, right? So I thought that was a really important thing that we did and we did it more and more on the later shows. But what about when they don't do it properly? And what about this thing of vendors that don't necessarily take things where they are supposed to go? It's important, a green waste vendor. And personally, I only know of two of them now. Uh, there may be more, but and there are two companies that dispose of your waste in a completely green manner. Like A, they know all the rules. They know, what, you know what's acceptable and what you mis- municipality and where. They will literally take things to the next municipality if need be because of disposal. They also hand sort, which is disgusting, but important. Somebody's put their food in the recycling bin. Now that whole bin's contaminated. They fix that for you and they make sure that it's not and that it actually can still be recycled. And those vendors, like those, the couple I know of, they also provide you with the metrics. Like they tell you how much has gone to landfill, how much went to recycling. And that's information that's really important for us to be tracking so that we can do things like carbon calculators and even just inspire people by saying, look how much we've managed to divert, right? So those are the kind of things you get from a vendor like that is, you know, the hand sorting, the, the, you know, making sure things get to the right place and also the reporting. So I strongly encourage everybody to either go to one of those vendors or talk to your existing vendor about changing to, you know, or or implementing some of that stuff. And the other things related to food waste that we did, Second Harvest is a company that we worked with. Um, There's also a company called Feed It Forward. They will come and collect your your excess craft service, excess meals, and, and they'll do it in every, you know, big and small. So they have an app. You can even use their app. So the office staff, if like they ordered too much lunch, it can be as simple as there's two leftover office lunches and you click it into the app and someone comes and picks it up. So we did that across, like the wardrobe department did it. You can have a lot of people using the Second Harvest app. And you, so you can do it in that little way where you can do it big and have all your leftover you know, food at the end of the day or your leftover meals. Whenever we film downtown, even though we order, we order food for all the crew, half the people decide to go out for lunch and there's like literally like 80 leftover meals. I mean, it, it can be exceedingly wasteful. Using the food rescue service, hugely valuable. There, there were on the show I did with kids just recently, there were a few different days where because of kid hours, we thought we would break for lunch, but we made a decision to stop at lunch instead. So our entire lunch order was just waste but it wasn't because we got second harvest to take them so it's a food rescue company they rescue food they divert food and they 
they take it to organizations that can use it. So they take food from grocery stores at that level. So it's like at the grocery level and that type of food goes to food banks. They take food from us that's prepared already. And that kind of food goes to places like homeless shelters. They figure out, you don't have to figure out where, who can use it. You don't have to figure out who will be willing to accept it. They do all that part. They're just, they're like this middleman charity. I also run a food bank uh, on my outside hours and uh, we work with them on that as well. So I think they're a great organization. Then other things we did, and a lot of it was about waste and food, other types of waste reduction. Batteries are really important. So we made sure we had proper battery disposal. I mean, one reason it's such a, seems like such a niche thing, chemical leaching right into our soil, right? Right into our water, killing our fish if we're not careful about what we do with our batteries. So we made that just an absolute, all batteries must be just, you know, must be placed into these proper battery collection was, you know, treated them like syringes because they're pretty serious things. And then there's everything that's left over at the end of the show, right? So we made a, a real point of taking a little extra time in wrap to sell, donate, make sure that everything went somewhere. And construction is one of the hardest because it's so easy to just bulldoze those sets and that's a whole bunch of wood. But we really worked on working with the construction department to find a way to take things apart. It, it, we even worked it into the schedule, to be honest, so that they could take more time to take things apart, to pull out you know, windows, doors, things like that, that we donated to Habitat for Humanity. There's, you know, there's a lot of places that you can donate those building materials, but they have to be pulled apart slowly. So that was another big thing, especially in the year of construction. Paper reduction is a big topic, and I know everyone is really worked on that through COVID. Um, our policy back from the pre-COVID show was paper copies only on request. Like everything is electronic distribution and it's only if you have a specific reason, an essential reason that definitely cut down. I know so often people are concerned that it costs more money. Here's an example that costs less money. It costs way less money to send your scripts out electronically than to waste all that paper and all that copying. We did what we could with accounting. I will say that it's ironically and oddly the one department that's having a real hard time going paperless so we we got it was two steps forward one step back very often with accounting because you do it electronically and then it would still get printed out so that's that's an area we can all work on fuel use um i think that's the other massive area and it's the other place where locations has to be involved locations and your lighting departments those are your two departments because the one big thing that we that we did it was tricky uh, was tie-ins right tie-ins are a, a great way at a lot of locations to to get ourselves off, you know off the generator and using the clean energy that we have available like we're very lucky here in Ontario that our electricity is so clean we really should be tapping into it. But what I found, the locations department is very protective of their clients, right? Of the, of the, of the locations. And they need to be because they need to protect them for us. So concerns about like, how do they, how do they get properly compensated for the power use? And how do we make sure that there's no damages? So those were things also that, you know, we need to work, you know, locations department can be part of. Because there was there was sometimes resistance to even ask a particular a particular location in case of sensitivity, and we'd ask and then it would be fine. You know, it, 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 we we did do it a lot. It was it was sometimes a sensitive conversation. We tried to use the battery the battery stacks um, as generators. We never really found a, a great opportunity. That's something that I strive for. They are very few available. And the amount of power that they hold is very, very little. The only time we ever used it was, you know how sometimes you're going to have to throw an extra generator down at a corner because sound's going to be forked down. Or you know, some things or somebody, somebody that just can't. So we used it like one or two days for, a, you know, an extra spot to... But it was tricky to, that's something that I would strive towards doing more. We pushed for LED lights on set, especially in the sets that we built. That was very successful. Um, I think that's that's kind of becoming low hanging fruit because they work so well and the DPs are really happy with them. So using LED lights, drawing way less power. Um, hybrid vehicles, um, that that's something that we absolutely committed to. I'm super committed to, and that's you know, to do with the whole hybrid pledge, but there's just not enough of them available. So 
we we did that as much as we could. We need more of them in the rental fleets in Ontario. And no idling policy. That was one other thing that contributed, you know, helpful. But it's amazing how hard that one is in Ontario because in the winter it's too cold. People want their heaters running. In the summer, it's too hot and with the air conditioning running. So again, it's a place where ultimately a hybrid or that's going to run on EV when it's sitting still is kind of at least a bit of a solution to because you can't get people to no idle as much as we try. I, I've mentioned a couple of times sustainability as if it's a department, and I, I, I know it isn't on every show. It wasn't on the first show. There was no sustainability staff when we what we did on the first show. By the second show... Uh, Partly because I had the the you know the privilege of it being a show for Netflix and they were willing to spend a little bit of money on sustainability, and I know not everyone is, but we hired a sustainability coordinator, so that person then ran this stuff and was in charge of like li you know, liaising with me, but liaising with locations and you know and and they're the person who you know when they needed to when we needed those water bottles they hired their own like person a, a PA person that worked with them to deal with the, you know, that moving their stuff around on location. I know not every show will do that. I think there's going to become more and more reason to have that person. And then once you have that person, things they can do and things that we did are tracking metrics, like I mentioned, so that you can do the calculator and come up with what your certification through Albert. Ultimately, I think we're going to want studios are going to want all the shows to be certified. And the other thing we did the, that the sustainability coordinator did, which I think is awesome, is uh, publishing a newsletter to the crew every week to kind of celebrate our successes and to share with the crew like how much we diverted. And she even uh, on the last show ran kind of a contest, right? Anybody who like give props to someone who's done something sustainable and we'll give them a little prize and mention them in the newsletter. So things like that, that get everybody involved and everybody knowing what we're doing, I think also really helps to inspire. It's not like this is going to be optional going forward. Almost every one of the studios has a net zero uh, target now. I mean, Netflix is the most aggressive. Theirs is this year. They'll be buying carbon offsets to make that happen, but they've all got them, right? Like Disney's 2030, NBC's 2035. Every one of them has set a, a year that is their net zero. So they're going to be pushing us to do this stuff. It's going to come push top down and us being ready for it matters. And also our crews are going to, they're going to want it. They're going to demand it. They're going to look to their leaders to, to have it available. Do what you can. Do one thing, make one difference and you'll inspire other people to do more.